Fifacy Week 2, Part 4. We now come to the last part of this week's lesson, the Nine Realities. This is the contribution of President Arroyo to the expansion of the priorities of the Department of Foreign Affairs. She first unveiled what were then just the eight realities in a speech at the diplomatic Van Donneur in January 2001, almost 20 years ago. Now let me just explain as a side note to all of you what a Van Donneur is. The phrase literally means wine of honor in French and is like a prolonged social celebration after an official ceremony like a marriage that marks the social life of the French provinces. In Philippine official tradition, the Van d'Honneur is a traditional reception hosted by the president of Malacanang Palace to mark the new year. As with many official traditions, the practice of an official reception to mark the new year dates back to the colonial period. In the United States, from the time of George Washington until the early part of the 20th century, the practice was to throw open the White House to any citizen who wanted to pay a visit to the American chief executive. This tradition was taken up in the Philippines by the governors general during the American colonial period. This tradition was followed by presidents of the Philippines and was called simply a reception or an at-home day when the president and first lady would be at home from the afternoon to early evening of January 1. In olden days, the annual New Year's reception was quite the social event, the traditional open house being an opportunity for high government officials, former presidential families, members of Congress, the judiciary, and the diplomatic corps and business and social circles to mingle freely and relatively informally in the palace. After the EDSA revolution, the traditional New Year's reception was continued, but came to be known as a Van d'Honneur. In the Philippines, over the years it has come to be considered primarily as a diplomatic event, which features a toast engaged between the President of the Philippines and the Papal Nuncio, who is the Dean of the Diplomatic Corps, where in Catholic countries or those that formerly belonged to the Spanish Empire, by tradition, the senior diplomat or Dean in the diplomatic corps as the papal nuncio or the ambassador from the Vatican. In other countries, the ambassador accredited to the country longest normally is considered the dean. Now going back to the main topic, after succeeding Estrada in EDSA II, President Arroyo held a late Van d'Honneur in January 2001 where she made one of her first policy speeches in order to, in her words, make sure that Philippine foreign policy would not only be truly relevant, but also focused. The nine realities recognized the new and emerging roles of certain countries and groups of countries and pinpoint the issues that directly bear on Philippine interests in the post-Cold War era. Almost two decades later, many of the realities of course remain true, but may have to be updated with the emergence of the Indo-Pacific region. Together with the three pillars of Philippine foreign policy, the two sets reinforce each other and must be addressed as one whole. And so, just to name to you the nine realities, let's go uh, at them one by one. The first reality is that the United States, China, and Japan have a determining influence in the security situation and economic evolution of East Asia. The second reality is that more and more, Philippine foreign policy decisions have to be made in the context of ASEAN. Third, the international Islamic community becomes more and more important to the Philippines. Fourth, the coming years will see a re the redefinition of the role of multilateral and inter-regional organizations like WTO in promoting common interests. Fifth, the defense of the nation's sovereignty and the protection of its environment and natural resources can be carried out to the extent that it gets others to respect its rights over maritime territory. Sixth, the country's economic growth will continue to require a lot of direct foreign investment. Seventh, a country as beautiful as the Philippines can benefit most quickly from international tourism. 
8. Our overseas Filipinos will continue to play a critical role in the country's economic and social stability. 9. The Philippines will continue to reinforce its ties with Europe. Now let me make just a few comments on each of the nine realities. First, the Philippines has had close ties with the United States, its only treaty partner, and bilateral relationship of comprehensive strategic cooperation with China, and a strengthened strategic partnership with Japan, at least in the last 20 years. Second, the Philippines is a founding member of ASEAN, which has now become one of the cornerstones of the country's foreign and trade policies. This is made manifest in the Philippines' policy to promote a more peaceful, stable, and free Southeast Asia through the pursuit of different initiatives in the policymaking, economic, trading, and functional cooperation activities. Third, the Organization of Islamic Co Cooperation, OIC, played a significant role in helping to maintain contact and mediate between the government of the Philippines and Muslim rebel groups in the southern Philippines for more than four decades now. The OIC is the world's second largest international organization after the UN, comprising 57 mostly Muslim-majority countries. The organization includes a number of members that are major energy exporters. In addition, the Middle East region hosts 2.2 million Filipinos. Fourth, the Philippines was among the 51 original member states and only one of four Asian nations in the United Nations. The country is one of the co-founders of the Group of 77, the largest intergovernmental organization of developing countries in the UN. The Philippines is regarded as one of the most active countries in the Asia and Pacific region in terms of peace support troop contribution. In fact, it is the fourth among ASEAN member states and 60th worldwide. As for the WTO, the, w the Philippines has been a WTO member since 1st January 1995 and a member of the GATT since 27 December 1979. However, the collapse of the WTO's current Doha Round of Talks in 2008 forced many countries to intensify efforts to resort to regional and bilateral trade arrangements. Number 5. The Philippines is the second largest archipelagic state in the world after Indonesia. With a total land area of 300,000 square kilometers, the Philippines is the fifth largest island country in the world. It, is also, it also has the fifth longest coastline of 36,289 kilometers in the world. One of the great triumphs of Philippine diplomacy has been the recognition of the archipelagic doctrine by the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. Apart from the wealth of natural resources on and under its land, the Philippine archipelago harbors the highest marine biodiversity in the world including the highest number of fish species and marine mammals. Number six, limitations such as the COVID-19 virus and in previous years, restrictions towards foreign investments have caused investments in the country to plummet. Additionally, the government's tacking of anti-big businesses has damp dampened domestic investments. Number seven, in 2019, the input of Tourism Direct Gross Value Added TG, TDGVA, to the Philippine economy measured by its GDP was estimated at 12.7%, which amounts to roughly Philippine pesos 2.48 trillion compared to the 2.24 trillion pesos made in 2018. Inbound tourism expenditure amounted to 548.76 billion pesos from only 445.58 billion in 2018. Eighth, despite political uncertainties across the globe, personal remittances from overseas Filipino workers reached a record high of 33.5 billion US dollars in 2019, almost 4% higher than the 32.2 billion recorded in 2018. 
This accounts for roughly 10% of the country's GDP. Remittances provide a steady stream of foreign exchange to help, help offset the widening trade gap and limit the current account deficit. Together with business process outsource, outsourcing receipts, or BPOs, overseas Filipino remittance flows augment domestic wages, translating into potent purchasing power to fund household consumption and even capital formation. And lastly, the ninth point, the Philippines and the European Union are coming up with a more comprehensive bilateral agreement that will further strengthen the dialogue, cooperation, and action in their partnership, specifically the issue of migration. There are more than 900,000 Filipinos living in Europe, while there are more than 30,000 Europeans living in the Philippines, not including Spaniards. However, EU-Philippine ties have soured since the Philippine drug war led by President Duterte. On 18 September 2020, the European Union pointed out the lack of human rights in the Philippines under the Duterte administration. The European Parliament discussed potential tariffs and sanctions on Philippine trade. With that, we end the four-part lesson for week two. Hope to see you at the next synchronous session next week. Take care.